Bruce and I have been uh, best mates for 20 years at least. Yeah. Um, he's one of the few. That's the grace of God. <laughs> no, that's the, that's the Shekinah anointment, I'm telling you. Um, I owe my life to him. He recognized me when few did, and he sacrificed. No, I recognize what was coming through you. I mean, you're, you're just an old southern boy, but I recognize the gospel. <laughs> and, and, it, and it took, I mean, now, here, here's the truth. Here's the truth. That tells you rubbish is coming. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Shekinah anointment. I, I just want, I've got two things. This is one of my best friends in the whole world, and it thrills me that I get to be here and you are my people hmm. and I get to be here and bring Bruce and Paul and Michael. I, I just, I got no more to say to that. Except, hmm. except that this. Hmm. Now just think about this. If Joe Chris can understand this, everybody's going to get it. Everybody's going to get it. Uh, it's on tape though, brother. Oh, uh, this, this, is, this is a uh, rare moment and beautiful moment for me. I didn't think I would ever see in the belly of the beast these brothers and sisters gather. I mean, come on. So we're going to pray, mm. we're going to pray for Bruce. Y'all hold your hands up and point them toward his heart. Lord Jesus Christ, eternal and beloved and faithful Son of the Father, Hamosios Topatri, anointed one in the Holy Spirit, son of Miriam, hmm. humble brother of the human race. Hmm. Thank you for finding us in our darkness hmm. and in our pain and coming all the way down to the, to the bottom of the abyss. Hmm. And from that place, anoint hmm. our brother Bruce this morning and let him speak out what he knows and break the spell and the veil of religion and darkness that mm. we may be free to sing your praises mm. and shine the light and the joy of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit out of our very beings. Yeah. Mm. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Mm. <laughs> Dr. Bruce Walker, Adelaide, Australia. Well, um, we're just going to pray before we start. So, Dad, thank you. Mike. Man, I'm working on it, guys. I'm working on it. Yeah. Are we there? Yep. Can you hear me? Yep. Dad, thank you that you've placed your son in us such that we find him. And Holy Spirit, thank you that you open our eyes that we find him. And I ask today, Dad, that we can all give permission for our heads and our thoughts and our worldviews and our structures and our beliefs to be brought in line with our hearts. And we do that so we might know the Father's Son inside of us. And in knowing the Father's Son, we know his hugs and his embraces, and his looking into the eyes of his dad, who is our dad, so that we can hear at the bottom of our soul, you are my beloved daughter, always loved you, you are my beloved son, and I love you. And we can let that drift into us because there are places we don't feel it. And may Holy Spirit, you say, Jesus said that he'll take what is his and you'll take what is his and he knows this beautiful stuff and make it ours and that's what we want today in the bottom of our little bellies. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Okay. So the first thing to say is I've just got some good news to tell you. No, I'm not Southern, so that's, that's good news. It's the first... Very southern, yeah. Oh, southern Australia, southern Australia yeah, yeah. I, I was I was going to move to Mississippi, but the immigration process required a lobotomy, so I said no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we went we went to get Kruger went to get a haircut the other day, 
and we walked in and, and the girl, girl said, oh, is this your son? <laughs> anyway, I just, we give each other a bit of rubbish anyway. Um, so the good news is, and it's not new news, but Christ, Jesus Christ is in you. Amen. And he's in you, in your pain, in your mess, in your trauma, in the places you don't like, in the places you've got walled off, in your hurts, in your griefs, and he's holding you there, and you never put him there. And you wake up to him there. That's great news. We have a gospel we can preach to people who are brain dead. We have a gospel we can preach to the poor. This is not the gospel of the rich and the powerful and the striving and the people who've got their shit together. It's the gospel for the broken, for the broken hearted, for the people who don't have anything. God didn't come to sanction the systems of the world and say the people at the top of the pyramid have got it right. He came for people. We have a different currency. Our currency is not money and the dollar bill and the capstone. Our currency is people and relationships and community. Family. So the first thing I want to say is that we're in a love story. We're in a fantastic love story. And if you go back in scripture, there's a whole bundle of verses that talk about before creation. And it, it matters for your brain where you start. If your brain starts thinking on something and you start from here and it's not the beginning, you can come to the wrong conclusion. So you've got to put your problem solving and all that God's given you in the right place. For example, <clears throat> when I'm seeing patients and I touch type, there's been times, not many, when I've been touch typing, but my fingers have moved off the little mm. markers. And I've been sitting there, oh yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, type, mm, you know, talking away. And I look up and I've got the right number of letters <laughs> and spaces and a paragraph of gobbledygook. <laughs> All right? Now, okay, if you start your thinking in here, if you start your thinking in here from yourself, from sin, if you start your thinking in here from your conscience, from guilt, you're starting in the wrong spot. Yeah. Right? So where do you start from? Well, you've got to start back. If the book's here, there's the book. Are there verses that speak about before the book existed? Are the verses in the book which speak about before creation existed? If, if I told this story many times, but I was building a retaining wall at home and I was trying to get it straight. So if you watch me, I was getting all the levels right and I was spending a lot of time getting it level. And if you got it wrong, you would have said, Bruce is interested in getting it level. But if you'd asked me why I was doing it, I was building a place for my kids. You're, so we can look at God's interventions in history and we can get it really wrong. So you've got to go back before history. And there's a bunch of verses which speak about the love story before history. And I'm not going to go through them all now, but I'll read some out. But Ephesians 1, 2 Timothy 1, 9, onwards. And thanks to Kruger, Titus. I say thanks to Kruger because he pointed out that I hadn't remembered it. In fact, I hadn't really read it before. Amen. So I'll start, I'll start with... Back. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. <laughs> Let's just start in Titus. Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect 
and the acknowledgement of truth which accords with godliness. The truth which accords with godliness is Jesus Christ, right? He's the only one who knows Dad. In hope of, look at this guys, eternal life which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. Oh, oh, you're in a love story that's speaking of you having eternal life and that was before everything got going. Oh, that's pretty nice, isn't it? Now this one here is, this one here is Timothy. Now, it's a little bit strong. It's so strong you can barely take it in, like it's just too big. So see if you can take it in. Most of you know the verse, God hasn't given you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. Anybody know that from Timothy? Do you know the verses that follow that? See, we stop on that because we're dealing with fear. Because that's the verse about fear, and we can tape it across our brain and hope to do something about fear, but it won't really do it. Follow this second verse. Verse 9, and this is about you guys and me. Look at this. Who has saved us? Past tense. Who has saved us and called us with a calling that's not of this cosmos, but a calling of the Father, Son and Spirit. A holy calling from them. Not according to what you do, Oh, not according to what you do, but according to his purpose, his desire, his plan, his loving kindness, his loving kindness, which was given to you in Christ Jesus before time began. Hallelujah. My goodness. My goodness, this is so strong. We can... We can't even let it filter in, but let, let's see if you can let it filter in. It's crazy. Before time began. And this has now been revealed by this person, this Saviour, Jesus Christ. Listen to this, guys. Who has abolished death and brought for us life and immortality to light through this good news of the gospel. My goodness. How strong is that? It's so strong you can barely even let it in. So we're going to talk about why we can barely let it in. Oh. So there's a love story. Somewhere in your soul, some of you, not many, probably none of you, just me, and just me, have got a black hole of pain. Anybody, when they sit still, sometimes feel a deep pain in your soul? Okay. Flip it the other way. Anybody not feel <laughs> a deep pain in your soul? Okay, so this is, this is really interesting that if we start before creation, we can enter a love story. We're going to talk about that. But that love story has to do something to you. We don't want you just to say, oh, I've got a love story up here and have the pain down here. What a waste of time. We could just join a church for that, couldn't we? <laughs> so let's, let's get going. There is... Oh, hang on. If I joined the church, I'd have to start giving money. And I could give some money and then they could make me feel guilty again and then preach some good news and bad news and the pain would go off, I give money, then I'm in a circle. We'll talk more about that later. That's not the gospel, all right? Talking about this. Now, I've put dots for God. And the only reason I've put dotted lines is there's not an edge on God. Would that be right? You can't sort of come across whatever God is and say God starts here and stops here. Would, would everybody happy with that? And I'm going to put three dots, and you've probably worked out why that is. One is for the Father and one is for the Son. 
and one is for the Word and the Spirit. And the Spirit's got seven spirits, so it's not as simple as we make it, but it is what we've given. It, it's the revelation that's been given to us as we enter through Jesus Christ. We meet Jesus, and this being is God. We go, my goodness. This being says, I have a dad. And we go, oh, my goodness. It's relational. And then as we know Jesus, we know his dad, and they grow together in us. And then we discover, oh, this is in the Spirit, and they're one. Oh, my goodness. And they're one and they're distinct. All right? So I've got to ask you a question. This pre-eternal love story is occurring with them and they are love and they want you to exist and they want you to eventually be caught up into their life because they're going to make you as beings and then they're going to make you as beings that, can, that are finite. One of them's going to jump into this to give you his eternal life which is his relationship with the others. So you're going to share in this. This is nuts. This is nuts. You've got to, you've got to think. There's so many layers. This is crazy. We'll, we'll talk about them. But the first thing is, where's creation? So women get this really well. Guys have more of a problem. Creation is in God like a womb. It's like a veil of souls. It's, it's all in there. This thing's got trillions of galaxies in it with billions and trillions of stars and probably infinite forms of life forms coming through in this universe. And we're one of them. We're four-fifths down one spiral arm of the Milky Way. Tiny little solar system. God knows what else is out there. But it doesn't change the good news for them or for us. Creation is like a womb in God. Now, who sustains this thing? But, okay, let, let, let's just try another one. Maybe that's not true. Maybe that's me. And maybe God's out here. Maybe God, G-O-D, is out there, and maybe I'm here. Or am I... In God. Now, look what happens to your soul when I start talking about you being outside of God. Can you feel it? You're separated. Can you feel the change in your soul? And feel the change in your soul. We say, no, you're in inside God like a womb and Christ holds you together. Can you feel the difference? Because that's really important you follow that difference because when we get down to here, this thing here, will stop you processing this thing here. You with me? Yeah. It really does make a difference. Yeah. Okay? So, where is creation? Okay, who holds this thing together? Okay. Let's read Colossians 1. So verse 15 onwards, he is the image, this is Christ, of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by and through Christ, the word, all things were created. So everything in here, in heaven and earth, visible, invisible, thrones, dominions, principalities, powers. All things were created through him and before him. And in him all things consist. Okay, so let's just start again. I want you to say, I consist and are held together in Christ. So just feel it in your soul. You're not out here. You're held together. And this applies for you, Hitler, Pol Pot, Stalin, your worst enemy, your mother-in-law, everybody. The person you hate. Every being is held together, sustained, created, and held together, and every being is part of this love story. They may not have your views on things, and they not, may not be as nice as you, or at least in your eyes. <laughs> but they're caught up in the love story as much as you are. Okay, that's interesting, isn't it? Because you know the people who, the people who teach this fundamental lie of separation which, if you go back in and look at it, this thing comes from Greek philosophy, 
and it's the darkness, and it's the death, and it comes from Plato, and it comes from the lie in the Garden of Eden. Yeah. Right? It's a deep thing in us. It's a lie. <coughs> it stands smack against Colossians 1. It stands smack against Christ holding all things together. I don't care how alienated you can get in your mind because you've got free will. You've all got free will. You've all got the capacity to think. I don't care how alienated you can get in your mind. You are not separated. You are held together by Christ even in your mess. Do you understand? So my mind can go off and do things because we've got freedom. Because this universe is not, is not controlled like marionettes. It's open. It's free. Everything is held together and given freedom, which enables you lot, not me, to go off course and become a mess. I, I never get a mess, you know, my life's been perfect. I haven't had any traumas or mess in my life at all. I'm just so whole. You got it? You are free. You are free to go off in your pain and mess. Christ holds you together while you, there is no control. There is love coming at you. There is relationship, but there is no control. Right? And that allows, that allows freedom and the mess. So let's come to this universe now and let's look at it again. Let's go back. Kruger was speaking about John 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. And he was thinking, all things were made through him. So all of this is made through, through the word. And without him, nothing was made that was made. Creation is in Christ. You are in Christ like a womb. None of this. <coughs> and in him was life. And the life was the light of men. What's the life that's in Christ? What does John 17 verse 3 say? Eternal life is knowing Jesus Christ and his Father. It's a relationship. It's a relationship. Oh, so in the Word is this relationship with the Father and this relationship is stuck into creation. Oh, and this relationship is the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness doesn't see, understand, comprehend, or extinguish it. So Christ is, let's, let's just put it this way, light. He's the light shining through all things. Now, I want you to pay attention here because, because um, we don't get this very clearly. Most of you have seen this, but just if you haven't. If I hold this up, can you see a shadow on the whiteboard? Right. <coughs> is there the same light in the shadow as there is on the whiteboard? No. no. Now that's how we think about light and darkness on earth. It's not saying that in John 1. You've got to get this. Christ shines on you, through you, out the other side, holds you together. Nothing stops his light. The light shines in the darkness. For us, darkness is where there isn't light. Christ holds the universe together. He holds it together. Nothing is hidden from him. In James it says there's no shade of turning. There's no shade of turning. You can't hide from this. Oh, I can't hide. Does that mean my little bits which I put inside and I suppress and that Christ might actually be shining on them, through them and out the other side and holding them together? Does that mean my griefs and my angers and bits I can't cope with Christ is actually already holding? Does that mean my unconfessed sins, which apparently he doesn't know about, <laughs> he's already holding together? Let's go through it again. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness doesn't see, understand, comprehend, extinguish it. The darkness, as Kruger pointed out last night, is not neutral. It's trying to go against the light, but because it's blind, it's pretty useless. It causes damage, but it can't really do what it wants because it doesn't understand. It's held together by the light. Oh. Wow. Yeah. Oh, think that through, guys. Oh, 
Colossians 1. In him all things consist. Oh, principalities, powers, they're all the angelic. Hmm, Satan is held together by Christ. Hmm. Where's dualism? Where's splitting? Where's pulling apart? There isn't. Satan is held together by Christ and his lies which have damaged most of America and most of the Western world, we're going to talk about this morning, because one of his fundamental lies of darkness is separation, by which he's able to build religion because Satan is the father of all religion. God is the father of all relationship. You got it? Satan is the father of all religion. Christian religion. All religion. The Father, Son and Spirit are the father of all relationships. Very different. So the light shines in the darkness. Christ shines all things. The darkness doesn't see, understand, comprehend or extinguish. It doesn't get it. Now, so we've got to put some darkness in here. Let's put some darkness here. All right. But the light shines straight through. So what is Darkness. Darkness is where I cannot see. The light shining on me, through me, out the other side, but I'm oblivious to it. And I, if you look at John 1, I'm raging because I don't see, understand, but I'm trying to extinguish the light. You got it? Ironically, I'm held together by it. Deep irony. This is the parable of the sower. Christ goes out to sow and sows the seeds and Satan comes and takes it away. Satan lives on the word of God. Go and look at it in the parable. He eats the seed. He's kept alive by the word. There isn't dualism. There isn't God over here and Satan over here. That's the lie of Satan. That elevates him to the position of being a God. We just have an angel that's got confused and is self-seeking and dark. And he has shared that with us. And he has shared his darkness with us where he can't see. He shared that to Adam and Eve and he said, God's not really good. You've got to understand the fundamental sin in the Garden of Eden because people go on about sin. They say, do you know what the problem was? Adam and Eve were told not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and they ate. That was the sin. No, that wasn't the sin. Do you know what the sin was? The sin was they believed that God was bad. That's the sin. That's the darkness. They shared in Satan's lie. And when they ate the fruit, that locked them with a conscience. The conscience locks us. The sin was not understanding God was good. Satan comes along and shares his darkness with them. So that's, that may be too fast for some of you. Okay, so the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness doesn't see and comprehend it. Now, we've had the love story. You're promised immortal life and that death is going to be removed from you. So how is this going to be? Well, something that's immortal has to share itself with you. So get your head around this, this word character, this Jesus Christ character. I was, I was, I was talking with a the Holy Spirit the other day and she said you're really on about this Jesus Christ character aren't you <laughs> it was a joke she was giving me a joke because because I'd been speaking to a religious man and he was telling me about all his spiritual experiences one day and I kept saying where's Jesus Christ in that he was a big preacher and he, he tried to pull rank and I've had angels stand by my bed. Where's Jesus Christ in that? And I just kept going. Where's Jesus Christ in that? He eventually stopped and looked at me and said, you're really on about this Jesus Christ thing, aren't you? <laughs> Dead set. Dead set. Now, so that got played back to me as a joke, you know. Okay, so what has to happen? What has to happen? They've, they've made the universe... And Christ is holding it together. Now, I want you to think of this. If your head can hold this, it's a head smash. 
He's holding the universe together. And while holding the whole universe and all its freedom and all its darkness, he's going to jump into the universe and become an embryo. He's going to become an embryo while holding the whole universe together. If you don't believe in magic or craziness or psychosis, read the Bible. <laughs> Can you see that the incarnation is nuts? It's absolutely nuts that God can hold the whole thing together and come in as an embryo. But look, the second thing is, he didn't just jump into what he made. You've got to, Baxter was hammering this last night. What did he jump into? He jumped into what we've created. There's two aspects to his incarnation. He entered what he created and he entered what Satan and us have created. So he went to the bottom of that. So there's no part of you that can get away. Because he's fulfilling a love story. And while you're in the middle of this, you're in a horror story. Do you understand? So your head's going off. God's not for you. God's not against you. Your conscience is accusing. You've got fears. You've got guilt. And you're trying to put on the pretty face for people and keep going. And, and you've got the culture saying you've got to do this. And you're in, really in a horror story. There's an eternal love story wooing you. You belong to the Father, Son, and Spirit. And he's placed his son in you. You're my sons. You're my daughters. I love you. I love you. And to do that, He's not only jumped into his creation and held that in the incarnation as an embryo, he's jumped into our shit, yeah. our darkness, at the bottom of you. Now, isn't that a miracle? Yes. I, if, if, you, if you understand the incarnation, it's the most crazy thing. People just say, oh, the incarnation, they talk about incarnation or missional church and they rabbit on about this word. And they miss it. It's, it's a nuts word. It's a nuts reality. That the Father's beloved Son. And John says, he became flesh. Sarks. He didn't become anthropos human. He entered our darkness. And then everything Kruger said last night about what he went through so that we would cut the covenant with God by killing his son. That's the covenant with God. The new covenant has been birthed by God coming in to fix up this, submitting himself. We beat the shit out of him, massacre him, kill him. And God says, yeah, now we've made a covenant. A blood covenant. We cut the covenant with God in Jesus Christ by killing him. Our contribution, our contribution was for God to empty our hands of any of our works. And that was in the love story. Not by your works. So he's even got to us in this part of the universe in our darkness. He's got to the bottom of us. Flipping heck, how good is that? <laughs> That's why it's possibly called good news. <laughs> but we need to we need to then say okay it's done that but that's not what I was taught now we need to undo what I've been taught so I can actually hear this so this here can get some benefit because I'm going to just say under my black hole who is there who is holding me underneath Deuteronomy are the everlasting arms or or, as Kruger has said, and just listen to this very carefully, the little Lamb of God, because in Revelation, who is worthy to open the seals? The Lion of the tribe of Judah, he has overcome. And I turned and looked, and there was a little lamb. Little lamb. Now, Jesus, John says, Behold the Lamb of God who... Well, the first thing is that they've got that wrong because it's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the Christians. 
who confess their sins right. No, 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 come on. It's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. world. Okay, that, if you can grab the world thing, start there. Let's do another flip. The Lamb of God who lifts away the sins of the world. Okay, let's go the next step. If we said in the Garden of Eden the sin of Adam was that he believed God was black, because that was the sin. The sin was he, he swallowed the lie of God being black and broke the relationship, right? <coughs> that was the sin. The Lamb of God who lifts away your sin, who lifts away your failure to see the face of the Father from the inside out. So at the bottom of you, and I'm not very good at drawing, is a little lamb. Looks like a boodle. Looks like a boodle. <laughs> There's a lamb. So, so guys, just stop and just ask yourself, say, Jesus Christ, are you in me? And just listen. Okay? Ask him another question. Are you in, in me underneath all my shit? Will you lift away my darkness and sin where I don't see the face of the Father? Oh. Oh. Do you see healing is not the removal of trauma or the forgiveness of sins. It's the giving of eternal life. This was promised in the love story. Eternal life is a relationship with Dad. This is promised that before creation, that you will have eternal life, which is not just longevity, it's this relationship. And death's removed. This is now placed in you, underneath you, this eternal life, Christ in you. But it's not like a static Jesus, like, you know, now you've got a... Now you've got a remote control at the bottom of your soul. You've got a living, dynamic relationship being who's sharing what he knows with the Father because the Father is with him. Because, guys, they're not pulled apart. So when Jesus jumped into this darkness, into the shit, who jumped with him? Father, Son, and Spirit. They're not pulled apart. So when Jesus Christ is in you, who's also in you? Right, so ask yourself, ask Jesus, does the Father love you, Jesus? Yes, he does, doesn't he? Jesus, do you love the Father? And, and now, the next question, Jesus, are you in me? Well, it's pretty logical because you hear him on the inside. The next question, this is a scary question, am I in you? Yeah. And then the Lamb of God starts lifting away the darkness and the sins of the world from the inside out. Can you see how that works? Mm. Wonderful. But that's not what I got told. What I got told, and you might have got told, is that you were separated from God. Anybody ever been told that? Oh, no. Yep. And then what you've got to do is you've got to... I thought it was just Australians. I didn't realise you did it in the States. <laughs> Okay, and then I've got to maybe acknowledge and confess and repent and renounce and be baptised in water and baptised in the Spirit. And this is very serious because this separation is serious business. So the sins have to be confessed properly. I can't just confess. I've got to confess them properly. And it just goes on and it just goes on. And I was asked once at a camp whether people who um, committed suicide went to heaven. And there's all the kids arguing about it. And they asked me, I said, well, why do you ask the question? And they said, well, you haven't had enough time to confess your sin. I said, oh, really? So they said, I said, does confession of sin get your sins forgiven? They said, oh, that, that's how it works. I said, oh, really? So I've got a question for the whole room. Does anybody here actually remember or know all of your sins? Yeah. Now just sit still with it. Because this is bullshit. It's got to be called. 
It's got to be called. You, you've got to call it. You can't let it sit there. It's rubbish. It's a lie. Next thing is, as you get older, and some of you look a bit older like me, right? As you get older, you realise that a lot of what you called sins were actually fruit. And it was fruit of this. It was fruit of deep pain. So the sin is actually not knowing God's good, and that's just the fruit. Paul calls the part of us which doesn't know God the flesh. The flesh is the part of me that doesn't know I'm loved. Keep it in simple things. All the flesh is, is the part of you that doesn't know the love of God. And then out of that comes all manner of mess. That's the fruits of the flesh. And as the Spirit comes down and you're healed, the fruits of the Spirit come out. You don't, they're not things you go and set about doing. It's fruit. So when you've got your fruit of the flesh sitting here because you're in pain and you're living out and you're chasing things, money, food, sex, drugs, whatever you're chasing out of your flesh, where's the sin? The sin's really the f down here where I don't know I'm loved. And yet we don't confess that. So have we really known what sin is? No. Are we really adequately able to confess sin? No. And in, go further, in John chapter 16, Jesus says when the Holy Spirit has come, he'll tell you you've got three big things wrong. You're wrong about sin, you're wrong about righteousness, you're wrong about judgment. Read it. I, I got told... When the Spirit has come, he'll convict the world of sin. They miss the next bit. He'll convict the world of sin, righteousness and judgment. The Spirit will tell you, you're dark. The Spirit's saying, you're dark. You've got sin wrong, righteousness wrong, judgment wrong. Sin is because you don't believe in me, know me, it's relational. You're wrong about righteousness because I'm going to the Father and you're coming with me in the ascension. And you're wrong about judgment because I've come to judge the evil one, not you. Read John 16. Get free from it. So you don't confess your sins to be forgiven. Your sins are forgiven because the Lamb of God removed those who confess their sins. No. The Lamb of God who removes the sins of the world. Jesus is the Lamb of God who has taken away... Look, and he did it while you were enemies, while you were clueless, while you were without strength. Read Romans 5, read Ephesians 2. While you were dead in your trespasses and sin, he took you down, raised you, ascended you. By grace you've been saved. Read Romans 5. He didn't ask you permission. What's going on here? He's fulfilling a love story. You're his beloved. You've been caught up in darkness. You're confused and twisted, but it doesn't stop the love story. Jesus didn't come because of darkness. Jesus didn't come before because of the fall of Adam. Jesus always had to come to fulfill the love story. Some part of the uncreated had to enter creation for you to have immortality and share in the life of the Father. But then when we built the darkness with Satan, he had to go to the bottom of that. And it became a bloody mess. You got it? Yeah. So let's just go. So there is us. And this comes from Greek philosophy. In Greek philosophy, God could not be part of matter. Matter was separated from God. There was 55 nested concentric shells like spheres, like little Russian stackable dolls. God moved the outside sphere and came, it came down to earth and the earth was controlled by astrology. The heavens dictated what happened on earth and God is, God is spirit and divine and in placed in us was a divine spark. So the immortal soul concept comes from Greek philosophy. It's bullshit, right? <laughs> we are created beings and we are fallible, fallible and we are not infinite but because of the incarnation and being joined to eternal life we are. Not in our own right. Okay? So, and then the goal of this was we had to escape the body and get back to God through holy living, acknowledging, confessing, repenting. This is Neoplatonism. It's not, it's not Christian. Neoplatonism. This is the religion of Plato. 
and the Western church is running the religion of Plato, believing it's the Christian. No, no, that's part of the horror story. We're called to a love story. This, 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 this thing comes from darkness. And the way it works, guys, it goes down like this. Dot, 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 dot. Dot, 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 dot. Matter can't be part of God, so matter goes to hell, and God goes to heaven, and they then say heaven is eternally separated from hell. Hell is eternally separated from God. Ever heard that doctrine? Yeah. Have you ever found it in the Bible? Nope. No. <clears throat> no, Revelation 14 tells you the opposite. It tells you that the lake of fire is in the presence of the Lamb and in the presence of the holy angels. There is no dualism. There is no God over here, Satan over here, God over here, hell over here. Everything is held together by Christ. Hell is held together by Christ. The lake of fire is held together by Christ. In the lake of fire, they meet the love of God, which they don't want. God doesn't change. He doesn't have two faces. He doesn't have one face for you, another face for someone else. God does not change. God is love. Father, Son, and Spirit, they are love. The lake of fire is the love of God. And it's in the presence of the Lamb, and it's in the presence of the holy angels. Read Revelation 14. It is not separated from God. But that doctrine of separation comes from Greek philosophy. And that's been stuck into you. And you think it's Christian. And you've got to protect it. And it's bullshit. You've got to call it. Next thing is, you've got to get back to God. So we acknowledge, confess, repent, renounce. Oh, but how do I know I'm doing it right? Oh, how do I do it right? Well, I've got to have my conscience because I have a little conscience sitting here judging me. So I have a sense of separation. I have a sense of fear. I have a sense of rejection. And I have a sense of guilt. Anybody here suffer from fear, rejection, guilt, which makes shame? And then what you do is you stand up and you preach about God. And God is holy. And He can't look upon sin. It's rubbish. That's a misquote of Habakkuk 1. A misquote. It says, You are too good to look on this and do nothing. And he kicks into Habakkuk 2 and he's, he talks about Christ in us. Fear, rejection, and guilt create shame. And then what you do is you start the whole process because the moment the conscience kicks off in you, you can't cope with yourself. So then you split yourself behind walls into a good you and a bad you. And then what this part comes out and goes to church and does the stuff and this stuff just sits there and then you can't cope with the accusation. So then you build more walls between your deep pain and your existence and you're all walled up. And then you get on the treadmill and you go to church and you do the thing. Oh, wow, but there's a problem here. Every, everything here is family. Everything here is filial. I'll make a covenant with you. I'm your God. You are my people. You are my children. Everything here is performance. Everything here is performing. Oh, it gets worse. Because then what you do is, over here, this is made of living stones. Building into a temple. Over here, the institutions and the organisations take for themselves the name of church. And then they stand between you and God in the name of God. John Locke, who removed the divine right of kings, who helped draft your Bill of Rights and the things as, not draft, but lead to your American Bill of Rights and, and a lot of the legal changes across the world. John Locke removed the divine right of kings and the religious institutions have taken his place of the king and stood in the place of God 
and claim for themselves the name of the church. This is a lie. The church is made up of living stones. What you attend is an institution. It is not the church. It, by calling itself the church with this misnomer, with this wrong nomenclature, with this wrong nomination, whichever way you want to put it, by naming itself the church, it takes for itself an authority it doesn't have. And then when you get people who get hurt in the institution, I've seen this as a doctor, when they come and see you, they're thoroughly confused because they've been spiritually abused by the hierarchy in the institution and yet somehow that's joined to God and they have enormous trouble recovering because it gets all confused. The institution is not the church. The church is the body of Christ. And you want to put it bluntly, the church is the universe, the body of him who fills all in all. And ultimately the whole universe will be the body of Christ and the sufferings of Christ until all of the universe and all of the entities and all the sentient beings and that are brought to a place where they are walking and participating with Christ ready for the new creation. You with me? That's the body of Christ. It's huge. I'm sorry, that's called the church. The head, he's the head of him who fills all things in all. This institution you're part of is an institution. Keep your language clear. Precision in language keeps your head clear. The institution can be a servant to the gospel or it can be an enemy to gospel or it can do both. It's free. But then what the institution does is it takes a tax from people and it uses tithes. Now, this may be a surprise to you, but do you know where tithes come from? Tithes come from when the children of Israel came out of the land of Egypt and God said, I'm not going to put yokes on you like the gods you've served. I'm not going to ask you to sacrifice kids. I'm not even going to take your money from you. I'm not even going to take your money from you. Well, what's the tithe about? Well, says God, everything is about family and filial and a party. And I want you to come up three times a year and have a feast and a party with me in Jerusalem and eat the rich and eat the fat three times a year. And then you say, how the heck are we going to afford that? And God says, you put aside 10% of your increase into your storehouse for you to go to Jerusalem three times a year and have a party with God. Oh, okay, God, you want me to have a party with you three times a year and to share in your family and in your fun and, uh, and that's what the tithe's for. Yeah, that's what the tithe's for. Right? But over here, you then... Over here... The gods... The gods of religion, which are driven by darkness, which seek self-existence. And in Revelation, she's called Babylon, and she's drunk with the blood of the saints. Guys, she's drunk with the blood of the saints. She's drunk with the blood of the saints. That's you, us. She's feeding off us. And she says... Bring me your tax. Bring me your tithes. Bring your tithes into the house. Do you want net blessings or gross blessings? <laughs> Are you going to tithe on your net or your gross? God is a slot machine. I stand in the place of God. God's not family. God's not filial. He doesn't pour his love on the just and the unjust and keep giving gifts. No, God's conditional. Pour your money into me and God will bless you. Press down, shaking together, running over a hundredfold. Bullshit. It's a lie. It's a lie. Dead set. And the tax which has been taken out of families, which can help children, which can help other people, which can help your kids and your families and things they need. You sacrifice and suffer and so we've got to do in the name of God and this is serving God and it's a lie, so be free. Go back and read, go back and read 
the Pentateuch. Go and read about tithing. Do a search on tithing. A guy who's joined Pericresis in Australia, or associated coming in, he was in a large, one of the large mega churches, and he was a teacher there, and they asked him to teach on money because they wanted to increase the, the cash flow. Yeah. <laughs> it's a business. It's a business. They've got to increase your cash flow. So they said, you're going to teach on tithing, and everybody out of fear and guilt and rejection can give money. So he did his study on tithing, and he came back and he told them, well, it's that having a holiday with God. <laughs> Kaboom! Out the door. Deuteronomy 14.22. Look it up. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Paul. Deuteronomy 14.22. It's about a holiday with your dad. Your dad does not put heavy weights on you. Your dad has gone and created a universe so you will exist. You didn't exist. He's made you. He's now put his son in you with him and he's sharing all the riches of heaven with you on the inside and he's not taking a flippin' tax off you. Can you see how contrary this is? It's a lie. It's a lie. It hurts. I think of all the money I gave I could have... and It hurt my kids. It hurt my kids. The reason is... The assets you've given are for blessing people. God's currency is not the dollar. This lives by the dollar. God's currency and the capstone, you know, Babylon. God's currency is people. God's currency is relationships. God's currency is community. Building, building people and families and communities. That's what your assets and money are for. Because Christ is in you and you never put him there. And Christ is in your neighbor and you, you never put him in your neighbor. And Jesus says, as much as you do it to the least of these, you do it to me. Do you see? There are brothers and sisters with their black, white, big, small, poor, rich, crippled, normal, sane, insane. They're our brothers and sisters with Christ in them. And your assets are for that. They're not for building an institution. Okay, so then we get on this and we pedal, 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 pedal. And someone said to me last night, it's like I felt like I was a donkey with a carrot held on a stick in front of me. Right? Another guy came to me and said, I'm on the hamster's wheel. Going round and round, he said, but the hamster's dead and the wheel's still going. You know what I mean? So, when do you get there? You don't. You've got to keep going. The joke of it is, Christ is actually based in you. So, the way it works, this whole thing, is in your soul, you've got an amygdala, a little nucleus in your brain, about here and through there, you've got one on each side, and... You either operate out of fear or love as a human race. And, you know, when you meet somebody and you fall in love, you have total serotonin. You have a neurological, humoral outflow. You're in one universe. You meet somebody else you hate or fear, you're in another total humoral, neurological universe. That's our experience. And we switch between them. With Garden of Eden, is God not good? We got switched to the fear side. When they felt guilty because the conscience was activated, they locked that through guilt. And the conscience is sitting there accusing them and that maintains the lock on your fear. So let's, let's just look at this because you've got to unlock yourself. In the Garden of Eden, there's two trees, correct? Okay. What were the trees at the middle of the garden? Good and evil and life. Okay. Which one weren't they allowed to eat? Okay. What's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in common language? Good, bad. Labor. Labor? Labor. Okay. How about your, assess your assessment of good, bad 
is your conscience. Can you cover that? Yep. So your assessment of good, bad is your conscience. Yep. So God says don't eat of the tree or promote your conscience. Would that be right? Okay. And he says, what happens when you eat of that tree? You die. You experience death. Okay. So let's flip it. Let's come back a bit. There's two trees in the garden. One's the tree of life and one's the tree of death. Because if you die, you eat of it, you'll die. Correct? So two trees, tree of life, tree of death. Now, when I got involved with the religious institution, after my experience of Christ, which tree was stuck into every orifice of my body? <laughs> now think it through. I want you to ask yourself, how have I been trained in life? Or how have I been trained in good, bad, morality, various aspects? Been taught to follow your conscience. And God says, your conscience can be wrong. So your conscience, you've got to understand this, guys. Your conscience accuses you and the Father, Son and Spirit don't. So who's right, your conscience or God? So the moment you teach conscience-based religion, you trap people. Now, funnily enough, you've got a capstone sitting here. And we know that the American dollar bill is a designation of Freemasonry. What's the religion of Freemasonry? It's conscience-based religion. Oh, funny that. Hmm. Oh, dear. Funny that. Say it again. Conscience-based conscience -based religion. You've got to do this. You've got to not do that. This is right. This is wrong. Wrong, right, wrong, right, which is all about morality. It actually brings death. What happens is people become squeaky clean. <coughs> yes, brother, as Kruger said last night, they go to church with the Bible under arms, kids following behind. And then what happens is this. Your good part, your good part has to put on a good show and strive hard and gee, do you do that? But then you slam behind the defences all of your pain, your messes, which is effectively, these are both flesh, because they don't know the love of God. If you remember, the parts of you that don't know the love of God are your flesh. So this whole thing is flesh. But these ones here, you push behind, but then they squirt out. <laughs> because you've got needs. You've got unmet needs. So you find top pastors run around screwing some of their congregation, but then they're ashamed of it, or homosexual activity, or greediness, or gambling, while they're maintaining a pretty facade. The poor people, they're your brothers and sisters who are trapped in an institutional crushing thing. They've been sold a lie that it's a conscience-based process. It's a filial-based process. You don't change because of your conscience. Look at this. The more you, more you activate your conscience, the more you have to activate your defences. Do you understand? The more you activate your conscience, the more you lock fear. I'm not saying we don't have a conscience and I'm not saying we, we live in an immoral way. I'm saying it's impossible to live in a moral way through your conscience. It's impossible to live in a moral way through your conscience. Romans 8. What the law could not do, right, right wrong, could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, through this mess. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled. <coughs> you live through the tree of life. Not through the good bad tree. The more you promote the good bad tree, the more you promote defences. The more you promote the good bad tree, the more your unhealed pain will not get healed. The other tree is the tree of life. The love story, you are promised eternal life. John says the Father has given a command and this is eternal life. 1 John says we've been given eternal life and this life is in his son. This life is a relationship. The tree of life is a relationship. And that relationship is placed in you. 
It's there now. That's the gospel. Christ is in you. You never put him there. He's there with his Father in the Spirit. He's underneath this, the little lamb that's going to lift away the mess of your life. And he's saying, you are my sons. You are my daughters. I love you. Let me love you. And you go, not good enough. (laughs) Not good enough. Not good enough. He says, let me love you. I haven't confessed my sins right. My toe was out of the water when I got baptized. It's not valid. (laughs) Do you understand this? The gospel, Christ is in you saying, let me love you. That's the first commandment. John 13, John 15, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, conjunction as I have loved you. So I've loved you. So therefore, so let's rephrase that. Let me love you so that you can love yourself and love other people. So let's come right back to the beginning. The command from Christ in you. He's in you, underneath your sins, holding you. He's in your mess, giving you the cuddles of the Father, the only beloved one. He knows the face-to-face looks of Dad. He's in you, meeting your deep shit and shame. And he's saying, you are my sons, you are my daughters. And you're crying out, I'm not good enough. And he goes, get a grip. This is stupid because it's a love story. It's not a horror story. You're in the wrong movie. You with it? This is, this is true. This is true. And you've got a, a dome over your culture with a synthesis of nationalism, religion and romanticism, the American dream linked with your country, linked with this God and it's sort of all fused together and all seamless and driving you. The gospel's cutting into that to say, no, rip it open. Amen. Because the gospel is Christ is in you and you never put him there and he's not playing the pyramid. He's underneath and he's lifting away inside you your blindness. And he's saying, you're my son, you're my daughter. And then you say, oh dear, oh dear, but what about, I've forgiven everything. The covenant I cut into the human race when you killed me. When you killed me, the covenant has three parts. You are my kids, you're my family, I love you. And Christ is placed in your head and your heart. That's the first clause. The second clause is, is leave each other alone. No one will teach his neighbour to know me because I'm placed in you so you can all know me. No hierarchy. No hi- Oh, no hierarchy. Oh, mm. oh, oh. It's about family. Oh, oh. Hang on. Hierarchy. Aren't there people who speak to me in the name of God, who have authority over me in the name of God, who tell me the will of God? That is a breach of the new covenant. That is blasphemy. That is breaching the new covenant. That is breaching what you have when you drink communion. It's a breach. Read Hebrews 8, Hebrews 10. The next thing, he says, I've forgiven your sins and your unrighteous acts I remember no more. So the covenant we made with Christ when we killed him and we beat him and we crucified him and we cut the flesh and we've cut this covenant and the spirit gave birth to him in the universe. He was born of a woman of water And then we killed him and we finished the covenant with blood, the spirit, the water and the blood. We birthed that. He then says, great, I've got you at your worst. I've got you at most religious, your most religious, violent, accusing, gossiping, slandering, worst against me. I've got you and I'm in the bottom of you now. And I'm saying you're my sons and you're my daughters. So if you can now, let your defences start to drop on the inside. Let your defences start. And just listen to him. Ask inside and say, are you the Lamb of God that shows me the face of the Father? Yes. And you'll listen to what he says. And so you can say to him, can you show me the face of the Father? Can I know your hugs, please? Can I know what you're sharing with Dad? Can I know this beauty, please? And you let it happen on the inside. Because the gospel is, Christ is in you. And you never put him there. And he's lifting away the blindness, 
which was put into the human race, lifting it right out. That was put into us from the Garden of Eden, from Satan. For this reason was the Son of God manifested, that he might destroy the works of Satan and darkness. This is why it's come to open our eyes. But that's not the whole reason he came. That reason is subsumed within the eternal love story. So you go right back to the beginning. And you know, get the fingers right, before the creation of the world, he chose you to exist. He says, you are my, you with all your genetic defects and all the freedom we've got and all the mess of your family, you're chosen and loved. Isn't this beautiful? He's chosen you to exist and he wants you and they've created you. And then we've been seduced by the evil one. We swallowed the lie of separation. We ignored the fact that we were held together in Christ. We couldn't move without being in, in him. We live and move and have our being. We ignored that. And then we've set about building bloody religion. Disgusting religion. Filthy religion. Satan is the father of all religion. Christ is not. Christ is the mediator and father and parent of all family and filial. And this thing then sucks the life out of us and it splits us, our soul, because we accuse ourselves because this has been made in the image of its father. The father is the accuser of the brethren and we then accuse ourselves. <coughs> and then we split ourselves and chop ourselves up and can't cope with ourselves. And then we make more and more defences. And then we become so sure we're right. And we're so sure we're right because this thing is so serious. So in the religious world, we set about crossing it. So we cross the divide between us and God by the preaching of the word. So the word goes out and that crosses it. No. Or we cross it by the impartation of the Holy Spirit as though the big man imparts the Holy Spirit. You got it? Mm -hmm. Or we cross it by belonging to an institution. Or we cross it by having bread and wine. The Lutherans. No, that's all missing the point. You start by not being separated. Christ is in you, underneath you, at the bottom of your pain, holding you. And he's not just a remote control on you. This is a being with his dad in the spirit. And he's meeting you, each of you saying, you are my sons, you are my daughters. Let me love you. Let me love you now. So if you can open up into the parts of yourself you don't like, the parts of yourself you've got away, the little boy or the little girl you think, God, you could never forgive me, you could never let me be accepted. He's saying, yes, I'm in that part now. Why don't you get with the program and let me love you? I'm already there. Oh, you can't look on it. Bad luck, I'm already holding him. I'm already holding your little boy or your little girl or little memory. I'm already there. And it, Bruce, it's just you that's scared of yourself. You're operating out of fear, Bruce. I'm already at the bottom of you, holding you. Isn't that lovely? Yeah. And so then we come down to this <coughs> and a deep black hole. And that manifests in so many different ways. And God will meet you there and Paul will talk about that next talk. Thanks, guys.